wife Molly right there. And uh, she's become my favorite wife after 35 years. And so we have fun together. That's, that's what, what, people think I'm sick here this morning. I got two communion juice and I got cough drops. So you think I'm sick, Steve, this morning? <laughs> Good to have you all in the house of the Lord. Everyone online this morning, we're glad that you are with us as well. And I am starting a new series this morning called Living a Disciplined Life. Don't go, oh, no, here we go. We're going to talk about discipline. Discipline's not bad. Bertram Russell said one of the reasons that Hitler lost World War II was he did not fully understand the situation. Anyone that brought Hitler bad news was punished. So therefore, after a while, no one dared to tell Hitler the truth. Not knowing the truth, Hitler could not act appropriately. So it's very important that someone tell us the truth once in a while. So that we don't live in just some kind of a bubble all amongst ourselves thinking that there is no problem. If you have appendicitis, you go to the doctor. And the doctor will prescribe you some medication. And if medication won't work, then you're going to have to go and have your appendix removed. You step by step take these steps to make sure that you get better. That's only wise. Can you say amen? Discipline means pay, paying the price necessary to win. To win. And we're winners this morning. Wrong crowd. <laughs> I said we're winners this morning. Lots of people would like to win an Olympic medal, but very few people have the ability to stick in there and work at it to win it. I'm sure that when Michael Jordan got up every morning when he was playing basketball, he didn't say to himself, oh, I'm so excited today, I'm going to go out and shoot 500 three throws. It's not fun. Even if we're going to win the race, we also have to discipline ourselves. Hear me this morning. Yourself has to be disciplined to bring our bodies into subjection so that we do what we should do and not let our bodies just tell us what to do. If you're living according to your feelings, you're going to get yourself in a mess. <laughs> so today I decided I would start with Fasting. That's tough to do. It's tough to do. I want to share with you this morning about fasting with a purpose. Mark chapter 9, verse 28. This is a week of prayer and fasting. And I like to say, if you do, the, do a fast, you can do whatever fast you want to do. On the bulletin, we have put there for you the Daniel fast. That means you can at least eat something on the Daniel fast. And I'll explain a little bit more about it a little bit later on. But uh, if you want to just do water... That's fine. Be very careful in fasting. Uh, watch how long you fast. You're going to fast more than a couple of weeks. Maybe you should come see myself or Pastor Dave and have a little chat with us. And uh, if you go on a long fast, make sure you're very careful how you come off that fast too for health purposes. But uh, the Daniel fast is on there, and I recommend it. It's, it's really good, and it comes from the book of Daniel. But this morning, I want you to notice something about fasting. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, verse 28, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out, speaking of a demon? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. There's some difficult things you're going to face in life. That's why it's so important to have fasting as part of your life. Now, this week when we have a week of prayer and fasting, if you fast this week, when you normally would eat, that's when you should pray. So you substitute that. You take that time to pray. Jesus' disciples were able to do some wonderful things under the authority of the power of the name of Jesus. But when they came up to this demon-possessed man, he couldn't do anything. Jesus said, because this is a spiritual stronghold. When you face with spiritual strongholds, they're only going to come by prayer and fasting. This morning... Fasting is a spiritual commitment. Spiritual commitment. You see the Daniel fast that's on there? Well, Daniel came up with that thousands of years ago. He was taken as a young man captive from his homeland in Israel, and he was taken to Babylon. That's where we read this morning in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. He brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, not the God of gods, but his God that he was serving. Verse 3, and the king spake to Aspenaz, the master of these eunuchs, and he said he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. I want you to get this. He said, I want the best of the best of the young people that they have in Israel. Verse 5, the king appointed them daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So, nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So these guys were entrenched in this for three years. Verse 6. Now among those were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Many times we refer to them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was their Babylonian name that they were given. Not their birth name. Think of this. These young men and others with them were taken from their homeland. They were taken from their Jewish learning, which was the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible is basically what they would learn as young people. And they were taken from that, not taught that, but all of a sudden they were taught the education of the Babylonians. Their diet was changed from that which was not kosher anymore. Even their names were changed. There's a message in here. I hope you're getting it this morning. Satan wants to do the same thing with our children and our grandchildren. Satan wants to steal them in their innocence. When they're very impressionable at a young age, he wants to get a hold of them. He wants them to forget who they are. They are a child of God. Never forget who you are. Walk like a child of God. Talk like a child of God. Have the child of God swagger as you go through life because you are a somebody. Don't ever think that you have to be like the world to be a somebody. You're already a somebody. Do you realize that the angels in heaven would like to be like you? They can't. Once you forget that they're a child of God, your children. He also wants to twist everything the Bible says and to pervert them with the doctrine of humanism and new age. That's what he wants to do. He wants to pervert them. You need to teach your children in your house the word of God. They need to hear it when they're real little. Because the enemy's going to come along and he wants to pervert what you've taught them. He wants to pervert the Word of God. He always has. First thing he'll do, he'll put a question in your mind. Has God really said? That's what he did in the beginning. Well, it's not that bad, you know. Satan made God out to be mean in the beginning. Well, you can't do this, you can't. Has God said that you can't eat any of the fruit in the garden? It's not what God said. God said there's one fruit, the knowledge of tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat of that fruit. But he twisted it. Parents, we need to fast and to pray for our children and our grandchildren. Verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not be defiled or defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. His parents had him bred something in Daniel. Daniel was one of the greatest characters and spiritual men of the entire Bible. Do you realize because of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, those four men, do you realize because of them, the land of Babylon 
eventually had a king that said, don't you ever say anything about the God of the Hebrews. And he also sent them back to their land. He sent them back so that they could rebuild their temple. Think of what God can do in your life, the life of your children, the life of your grandchildren, if they're wholly given to God. Daniel was very clear in his objection to the Babylonian food that they had. The king's food was against Jewish dietary laws, and also the king of Babylon's food had been food that was offered up to idols and demons. And he said, we're not going to eat this stuff. And the eunuch said, well, hey, if you read the story, you're going to make me look bad if you guys are all looking sickly and weak. And, David, and Daniel said, no, no, you let us eat our food, what we eat. And after that certain amount of time goes by a week, he said, you come and take a look at us. And if we look worse, we'll have to give it up. They came back and they looked healthier than anybody else. I'm telling you, you can do nothing wrong but bring your children up around the things of God. You want them to excel in the things of this world? You want them to overcome the battle of depression and fear and anxiety? Teach them about the things of God. Daniel, fast, involved a spiritual commitment to God. I read it again, Daniel 1 and 8. Daniel proposed or purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Y'all still with me this morning? Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Serious business. Whom you have from God and you are not your own. That is contrary to humanism right there. Human says it's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. Not what the Word of God says. It says in verse 20, you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which our God's. Our body is where the Holy Spirit resides. Think of that. If you've given your life to Christ, ask Christ to come in. The Holy Spirit's in your life. The Holy Spirit resides within you. The Holy Spirit is within you for a purpose. It is to convict you of sin. It also is to show you and to give you the will to do what is right. The Bible says in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. To will and to do. You say, well, I just can't do it. No, if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit and do the right thing, it'll give you the will to do the right thing. Can you say an amen this morning? So listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Many people have an inner desire to have better health, a better life, or do better things, but they just can't keep themselves from junk food. You know, I say ouch to that one this morning. I love chips, man. I tell you, I love chips with everything that is within me. There's times my wife won't even allow me to go down the chip aisle. Says, no, you don't need to go down that aisle. Don't go down that aisle. Because I love chips. I mean, some, some of you have a problem with sweets and stuff like that. Not me. You can have all the cake you want. You can have all the cupcakes you want. You can have all the pies you want. Just let me go down the chip aisle. <laughs> Bible says in 3 and 3 John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. God wants us to prosper in all things. It's the word of God. And be in health just as your soul prospers. So I believe that God wants us to prosper in all things, but I believe that God wants us to have a healthy body as well. Fasting helps you physically. It's good for you. I didn't realize this, but I found out this week that our youth leaders, they fast a day every week. That blessed me. I said, wow, that's great. That's wonderful. See, fasting is a spiritual commitment. Secondly, fasting is humbling ourselves. Certain things we just don't want to do, but we have to humble ourselves to do them. And true humility, when you're truly humble before God, that gets the attention of God. Yes, prayer gets the attention of God, but when you humbly come before God, you get the attention of Almighty God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be in submission to one another and be clothed with Humility. Why? For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. 
So when you humble yourself before God, it's going to do you good. You're going to find grace that you need, and you're going to have all the uh, exaltation in God's time, not your time. Humble yourself to God. Say, God, I, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. God resists and opposes those who do, don't walk in humility. But I like what he says. God, on the other hand, gives grace to the humble. I want grace. When I stand before God, there's only one thing I want. I want grace. I want mercy. Therefore, we should sow mercy to others. Can you say amen? Blessed are the merciful, Jesus said, for they shall obtain mercy. Fasting is a spiritual means of truly humbling ourselves before God. Now, sometimes it takes a lot of grace to make it through life. I don't know about you, but have you noticed that life is spelled L-I-F-E? Right in the middle of life is an if. That lets us know that we're going to go through stuff in life. When your back is against the wall and you don't know what to do, when you're in a hard place in life, we need even greater measures of grace to make it through. And God will help you. You say, what do I do? That's a really good time to say, God, I'm going to go before you and I'm going to fast. And I'm going to pray about this. That's exactly what Ezra did. In Ezra chapter 8, Ezra called the people to a fast. He realized that they were in desperate need. And when they were in desperate need, he said, God, these are desperate times and we're going to take desperate measures. So we need you to give us the answer. You knew the only way to get there was through humbling yourself in prayer and fasting. And Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, then Ezra said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God. He proclaimed a fast, why? So they might humble themselves before God to seek from Him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. Fasting from a sincere heart will get God's attention. God's concerned about you because He loves you. True humility is also the pathway to God's blessing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 again. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. That exalting is going to come. Not that people are going to come and bow down, but He'll put you in that place that He has prepared for you. I believe that every person, has, God has a plan for their life. You want to find that plan? Humble yourself before God. Live a life of prayer and fasting, and God will bring you to that place in your lifetime because that's a promise of God's Word. You realize that God's way is the best way? Well, that's easy to amen, isn't it? But when we don't want to go God's way, we just kind of keep that to ourselves and do our own thing. Yet so often we, we just get ourselves in a difficult situation, and instead of humbling ourselves, we complain or we try to manipulate the situation to work it out the way we want to work it out. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, but the ends thereof is the ways of death. It usually doesn't work out well. Here's what happens. When we, try, when we complain as a child of God, and we try to manipulate to make you know, it happen the way we want to make it happen, it makes God look weak. We serve a God that's all-powerful. Amens are getting weaker and weaker. We serve a God that is all-powerful this morning, and what you need, God can provide it, and He will provide it. And when you're backed up against a wall, God will take care of you. Live it. Don't make God look weak. Reading in Ezra chapter 8 again, verse 22. For I was ashamed, Ezra said, to request, you got to get this, to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, here's what they said to the king, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this. And guess what? He answered our prayer. He said, we didn't want to go before the king, and we didn't want to ask him, you provide a protection for us and soldiers for us, because we testified that God would take care of us. 
So he didn't go to the king and try to manipulate. Okay, God, we're going to go, but I'm going to go to the king and make sure he'll give us something to go with. We'll, so we'll have some soldiers. He said, God, we told the king you'd take care of us. Now we better walk it. We better live it. We better show it and talk it in our life. Fasting is humbling yourself before God. Also, fasting shows true repentance. True repentance obtains God's mercy and forgiveness. True repentance. Sometimes repentance is not always true. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. That's sincere stuff right there. Notice what's involved there. Turn with your heart, all your heart, fasting, weeping, and mourning. God wants to see that we really mean business, that we're not just playing games with God. It's easy to go to church, I'll be honest with you. I've been in church for 55 years, a little over 55 years now. Because I've been, to church, been in church all of my life. And I have seen people, and there have been times in my life, I play church games. Play church games. But God wants to see in our life if we really mean business or just playing games. You see, evidence is true Repentance. That's the person that completely yields themselves to God. goes on in Joel, it says this, Joel 2.13. So rend your heart and not your garments. Years ago, if they were you know, showing themselves as repentant or sorrow or whatever, they rend their garments. God said, rend your heart, not your garment. You could rend your garment and everybody say, oh, look, look at them, how, how repentant they are, you know. Well, it just was a look. But was their heart truly repentant? That's what God looks at. He looks at your heart. So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Can you say, praise the Lord? Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. True repentance. True repentance is something that... uh, Gives us power over our flesh. You all realize we battle with the flesh, right? Battle with the flesh. (laughs) When you don't want to do the right thing, you're battling with your flesh. We all have that struggle within us, and we'll have it until until we die and get to heaven on the other side. And Jesus warned us in the Word. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You don't come to church and the Holy Spirit is there. Do you feel the presence of God? Yes, Lord, this is the way I want to live. I want to live that way. Then you walk out, and the flesh gets weak. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, because we all have to deal with the flesh. So many times, it's in our head, but not in our heart. It's like the little boy. He was getting in trouble all day long. His mother was just, get out of this, get out of that, get out of this, get out of that, get out of that. Finally, she had enough. She said, you're going to take a time out. I want you to go over there and sit in that stool. <laughs> So she sent him over to the corner, and there's this little guy, he's sitting on the stool. A few minutes later, goes by, and he looks at his mom, he says, Mom, he said, I might be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. We all know what that is. There's just something within us. But fasting supernaturally takes it from our head and puts it in our heart. You begin to fast. It breaks, it breaks the power of the flesh because you're denying the flesh. You see that? Your, your, your body's hungry, you want to eat, you know, you go by the chip aisle, oh, no chips on the Daniel fast, you know. But it, you're denying your flesh and it breaks it down. True repentance also will bring revival. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you know this, if my people, there's that little word if there at the beginning. That word if means on the condition that, so it's conditional. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, he said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God is calling upon us, his people, to repent of our sins and repent of the sins of our nation. You realize America is a sinful place? It really is. I was reading the other day how many uh, children we murder a day. It's like 48,000 babies we, we murder every day. That's horrendous. And uh, if God doesn't judge America, 
He's going to have to come back and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. The kind of revival that we're talking about only comes by prayer and fasting. Notice that when you talk about discipline and disciplining yourself to prayer, disciplining yourself to fast and allowing the Holy Spirit to go over in your life, it's like kind of cuts against the grain, doesn't it? I thought about all week long when I was doing this message. I said, you know what? This is uh, cutting against the grain here, the old flesh. Daniel said in Daniel 9 and 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Man was serious about the things of God. If there was ever a righteous man or a man of God, Daniel was that man. He wasn't living a sinful life, yet he identified himself with the sins of the people. You see that? So when we fast and pray, we need to pray for our nation. God, forgive our nation. Forgive us of our sins. Daniel stood in the gap. He humbled himself, repented, prayed, fasted for the people. We need to stand in the gap. That's why we need to have a prayer life. We need to have fasting in our life as well. Some things only come, Daniel knew, by prayer and fasting. Some of the things that we're dealing with are spiritual strongholds. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the only way it's going to bring those down is prayer and fasting. Not going to church on Sunday, which is great. We need to go to the house of God. But that, that doesn't bring down strongholds. Prayer and fasting. Fasting shows true repentance. And also, fasting breaks, brings spiritual breakthroughs. It's a spiritual weapon. There are certain things that you, you just you have no weaponry for because it's spiritual stuff. So therefore, we have spiritual battles. We have to use spiritual weaponry. But if we're not using spiritual weaponry, we're losing. We're losing the battle. Don't raise your hand this morning, but you ever felt like, man, I'm just, I'm really losing the battle with my old flesh? Fasting. It's one of our spiritual weapons. Prayer, one of our spiritual weapons. It's a weapon, however, that too few Christians actually use. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus is speaking here. Notice what he said. Moreover... When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. This is, this is humorous to me. Where were you when the lights went out? Anyhow, that scripture is humorous to me because these guys were trying to mark up their face and make everybody look, he must be fasting. Look how gone he looks. Look how weak he looks. Jesus said, don't do that. You fast, you should go about as if nothing's going on. You're feeling great. But notice he didn't say, if you fast. He said, when you fast. Fasting is assumed to be a natural part of the child of God's life. When you fast. So why don't believers fast regularly? Well, most Christians don't fast because they don't understand it, for one thing. A lot of people think, oh, if I fast, I'm just going to get hungry, I'm going to get weak. How many in here get hangry when you get hungry? Anybody get hangry? Most of my family, Levi's like that, Jelani's like that, my wife says I'm like that. But when we get get really hungry, we get hangry. My daughter, when she's hungry and she comes to the table, she wouldn't care if the Queen of England was there. She's diving right in. She doesn't care whether you've prayed, thank God for the food, or if anybody else has anybody, or if there's starving people at the table. She just wrote right in, and she's hangry. Don't talk to me until I'm not eating. But that's not what fasting is. When you, when you fast, as I mentioned, you have to pray. You're denying yourself the flesh, but what people don't realize is this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, you walked in here in the flesh today. You're going to walk out of here in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Fasting does not make you more spiritual. Fasting makes you more aware of the Spirit. Because you are are humbling yourself before God. You're saying, God, 
when I should be eating, I'm going to pray and I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to do without food or you're on the Daniel fast, whatever. And it makes you more aware of the spirit realm. And therefore, when you pray, you'll find your praying is different when you're praying aware to the spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The first thing you're going to discern when you're on a fast and your spirit is opened up to God is where there's sin in your life. That's the first thing. So if I go fast, he's going to show me about all other people and their problems. No, that's not what it is at all. First of all, he's going to open it up to you and you're going to be convicted in your spirit. And you're going to say, you know what? This is not right. This is not right. And it'll help you. And when that happens, you're going to break down some spiritual barriers that have been holding over your life. Because you're going to say, God, I've been wrong. You're going to repent. True repentance is going to come. Humility is going to come because you've been opened up to the Spirit of God. Also, it'll make you have a burden for others. The needs of others. Sometimes you'll find when you're fasting and praying and all of a sudden you'll become broken for other people. Because you have a, a, a prayer that comes over you and a burden that comes over you for other people. And you'll begin to pray for them. God will open up to you in the spirit realm exactly what's going on. Paul tells us that we can't understand the things of the spirit. Because we walk around a lot of times in the flesh. We have to walk in the flesh. We talk in the flesh. But every once in a while you need to get alone with God and presence of God and pray to God. And Listen, when you pray, pray however you want. You know, don't watch how Natasha prays. Don't watch how Nicole prays. Don't watch how Ralph prays or Stephen prays, Pastor Dave or Pastor Ralph. Don't, don't watch us. You, it's you. You need to talk to God from your heart. And as many times, I don't say anything. I sit in the presence of God and I just let God speak to me. I don't know about you, but you ever, you ever know certain people? I know one guy. He's from Massachusetts, so he doesn't come to church. But one guy. And if I ask him a question, that's it. I won't say another word for about another two hours. I'll say, and I, ha- I literally, I hate to ask the guy a question. I ask him a question. It's, well, let me tell you about, and it goes from this to this. Never closes this at all. So I, I just, I don't want to ask him a question at all. I really fear asking the guy a question. Sometimes we're like that with God. We're just, oh, God, I need this, God, I need that, and God, I want this, and God, I need that, and God, I want this. We just come to God like he's a candy store, you know. That's what God, God knows our needs before we ever ask him. God doesn't have a problem with you. Go and say, God, I need a healing in my life. But once I tell God, God, I need a healing in my life, I know God knows that. And I come before God, and many times I'll just sit and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me. And I was taught when I was real little by my mother a prayer. I'll never forget it. She used to do the kids' church when I was a little kid, toddler. And she would tell the kids, and they pray. She said, just say, Jesus, I love you. And I'd say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Something powerful about that. That's a powerful prayer right there. I know you say, well, that's not very deep, and they're not using the King James language. You know, some, some people, when they pray, they, they pray the King James language. Thou heavenly Father, thou art, you know. You don't have to do that. You just have to be real before God. And if you're not a talky person around other people, you're likely not going to be a talky person in your prayer because your personality is going to come out when you're talking to your best friend, which is God. Talk to him. Talk to him. And if you've never fasted, why don't you try it? Try it. Say, well, I don't know that I can do a full week. I don't know what I can do, um, you know, two weeks. Jensen Franklin, he always promotes the, that 21-day fast, which they start, I believe, today in the, his churches that he pastors. But whatever you can do, youth, they do one day a week. Try it. Try it before God. Prayer. Prayer should be part of your everyday life. Not once a week, not on Sunday. Every day. I prayed this morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. I was coming down 37, and it was icy. <laughs> it was icy on the roads this morning. I, but I was praying, talking to God. Not God keep the truck on the road, but I was just telling God, I love you. 
And I prayed for a great day at Praise Tabernacle. I prayed that the anointing would be here. And I just told God how much I loved him. And I prayed for my wife. I prayed for my children, my grandchildren. I prayed for them on my way over here. And it's almost like every morning that's, that's a, something I do. And then I like to get along with the Word of God and talk to God through His Word. I read it, meditate on God's Word, does something for me. Do you ever notice the older you get, the less sleep you get? Anybody notice that? My wife gets up about around 3, 3.30, 4 o'clock, and uh, every day. And she goes downstairs, and I, I look, she's got all her, her devotional books and her Bible there, and she's writing her notes in it. Uh, she, she's feeding herself. you got to feed yourself. Here's what happens you become a pushover for the enemy. You say, well, I don't, I'm, you know, I, I'm just not as spiritual as you, pastor, or your wife. Baloney. Yeah, You're just allowing yourself to be a spiritual wimp. You need to eat the Word of God. You need to feed on the presence of God and the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And all of a sudden, what does that do? That strengthens you. You're not going to come out of prayer and sin. It's not what you do. You're going to come out of prayer and fast and say, you know what, I think I'll go rob a bank. It's just not going to happen that way. Because what happens is, is it changes you on the inside out. It makes a difference. And that's why you need to pray and talk to the Lord. It's got to be more than, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. You know, that's, it's got to be more than that. That's, you gotta, you're talking to your friend. If I came home every day and said to my wife, hey, I like you. You're nice. Nice supper. Have a nice night. You know, it's not going to work that way. Because I come home to her and I tell her from my heart how I feel about her. That's what God wants, from the heart. Fasting is part of living a disciplined life. Amen. I'd like for our ushers to get ready this morning. We're going to have communion today. It's the first Sunday of the month of January. What a privilege we have this morning to go before the Lord and remember the Last Supper. You realize... You need a healing in your physical body. It can take place this morning, right now. It can take place. When all the power went off, so did the clock go off. So I'm looking at my watch this morning. You need a healing in your life today. God is bigger than cancer. He's bigger than a back problem. He's bigger than aneurysms. He's bigger, bigger than it all. I believe that God can heal of anything, of anything. As your faith be the Bible says, so be it unto you, as your faith is. Let's have faith in them this morning. And as we enter into this new year today that we've entered into, let's just say, God, I thank you for the hope that I have in you. Thank him every day. Lord, I thank you for the hope that I have in you. Don't complain about life. Begin to thank God for what he's done for you. Bring your thanks before God. The Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing, that we are to bring our thanksgiving before God at all times. Paul said he was thankful. Whatever state he was in, he had learned to be content. And he talked about thankfulness. I found that when I be thankful before God, that a lot of times all those things that I thought about that were negative, they kind of go away because I'd be thankful to the Lord. Would you stand with us this morning if you would? Just before we take communion this morning, I just want to explain something about communion. Communion, we are remembering the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ. I do not believe in transubstantiation. I don't believe that this blood is going to turn into the literal blood of Jesus Christ, and I don't believe that the wafer is going to turn into the literal body of Christ. It doesn't have to. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's over. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. So today, I'm thanking God for what He's done. Bread represents the body of Christ. We now are the body of Christ. Members in particular, the Bible says. We need to be good to the body. You need to love one another. You know where love needs to start? It needs to start right in your home. With your spouse and your children and your immediate family. And then it needs to also extend out to those that are in the church, in the body of Christ, whether it's this church or another church, we need to love on people. It's so sad when Christians don't talk to each other. I believe that grieves the very heart of God. I really do. And so today, forgive people. Learn in your life to forgive immediately. And the blood represents Christ's powerful blood that covers all of our sins. I'm thankful for that this morning.
You see, when God looks at me today, I'm righteous. If you've given your life to Christ, you're righteous. Because He has covered you with His blood and His robe of righteousness. Don't ever let the devil tell you you're no good because you're a child of God and you are righteous. Yeah, but I got upset last night. I kicked the dog. Well, your flesh came alive for a minute. You ask God to forgive you for kicking the dog. You're still righteous. Jesus also cleanses us from all sin, but also it, you can be healed today. How many in this service this morning need a healing in your body? Amen. Let's believe. Believe this morning. There's only one type of individual that should refrain from taking communion this morning and that is anyone that has never given their life to Jesus Christ my prayer is this that 100% of the people in this room will participate in communion this morning that's why I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed right now if you would if you've never given your life to Christ I'm going to give you that opportunity right now before we take communion to give your life to Jesus how many are in this room and say pastor I need Jesus in my life. I want to give my life to Christ today. If that's you, put your hand in the air right now so I know who I'm praying for this morning. Amen. I thank you for all those hands this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Say this prayer with me, everyone, if you would. Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary for me. And I believe also that on the third day, he rose again. And I also confess that I am a sinner, but I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me by the power of your blood. And someday I will meet you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. As they sing this morning,